Thank you so much. Thank you so much for honoring to be a guest on my podcast. I really appreciate it. So um, before we continue, uh, welcome everyone to this podcast, Distress with Dr. E. I think this is episode 10 or 11, one of them. <laughs> so it's been an interesting journey. And with me here is a wonderful lady I really respect and I admire. She she is a, an embodiment of knowledge. She's an embodiment of knowledge, especially when it comes to the mental health space. And I've invited her today to help us through emotional intelligence in the workplace. And um, I'm going to let her introduce herself. But said, just tell us about yourself. I'd like to commend you and affirm what you're doing, <clears throat> excuse me, as a stress management coach. I mean, helping people to identify stress and ways to manage them. So I'm Kosa De Kristana Ilaki. I'm a mental therapist. I've been in the counseling and therapy profession for over eight years now. And then I help men, women, and children. I started my work as a school counselor, helping teenagers and adolescents understand the challenges of life, how it affects them, how it affects their academics, and then how they can make better plans to transition into fulfilling and healthy adults. Then in the last two years, going to about three years now, I moved into providing mental health support and services. And still um, attending to men, women and children, because I'm passionate and particular about children, about that particular um, spectrum of development, because we have children, we have teenagers, and then we have adults. And I believe that if we can work on teenagers, I mean, work on their wellness, we will work on their perception, work on the seemingly you know, little challenges that affect them, that we you know as adults, they would transition into adults that are healthier, that are positive, and then you know, more focused when it comes to life and self-driven as well. Wow. You know, that that makes sense. Um, during the stress management summit last year, your teaching on my child's mental well-being it was really sound, really really sound. I had to bring it again. And Thank you. let me let me let me pitch um let me pitch a project at the moment now. <laughs> so for this year's summit, I'm thinking of something re regards to family. You know, mm. as in something that has to do with family, because I want this year to be focused on the family unit, you know, to see if there is a way we can um, teach something or just help families, help marriages, because nobody is happy with this um, everyday news of divorce, everyday news of children growing up in, in broken homes. So I want this year's on to be focused on families. And I was wondering, can I invite you again, please? <laughs> I would love to be a part of the summit. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. I hope I didn't put you on a spot. No, not at all. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I appreciate. <laughs> okay. So today um, I want, I wanted us to talk about emotional intelligence in the workplace, okay? Because, oh my God, because the workplace is such a place that you meet different people. You meet different characters. And you meet people that respond to stress in different ways, you know? So I want a situation where how do we try to manage our emotions when people express their stress in certain ways that may come off as rude or they may become irritable to us, as in they will just do something that gets us on our nerves that may make us want to have an outburst of our emotions. So what can you say about emotional intelligence in the workplace? Okay, so um, I love using the teaching approach. And um, I, I would start by, sometimes I start by thinking people should pardon me, but I think I should not apologize anymore. <laughs> Once a teacher, always a teacher. So I'm going to split um, this concept because emotional intelligence is a concept. And there are two key words, talking about emotions and talking about intelligence. 
So you know, emotions has to do with how we're feeling, understanding how we're feeling, what our feelings, you know, uh, is pointing to, is directed towards. And then intelligence is the level of knowledge that uh, we have in consciousness of, the level of knowledge that we have. Now, let me hear these two distinct words together. Emotional intelligence is understanding how our emotions work and how to manage them. So it's a different thing to understand, to know that yes, we have emotions and also have the knowledge on how to manage, manage them. And I think this is where the challenge comes from in workplaces. So we know that, ah, oh, this is really lacking. Using myself as an example. She's the type that will come to work always frowning, always, you know, irritated, any small thing, chi, 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 chi. no one must go to our desk, you know, and all of that. So we have the knowledge or the understanding of certain emotions that are peculiar to this person. How do we manage it? Like the question that you asked. First off, we need to even understand ourselves. That's the truth. Because a lot of times I have seen that as adults, even as grown-ups, but people expect this of us. Most times we don't understand ourselves. Even as adults that we are, we don't understand ourselves. And the ability to understand ourselves is to be self-aware one, to be empathic with ourselves. In the last six months, a lot has happened in, in my life that normally, or I would say before now, before I started paying attention to my mental health, to self-awareness, I was from 2020, I would have talked down on myself a whole lot. And sometimes we do that. We may not do it openly, but for some persons, it has become a struggle for them that they, they even say it openly, they talk down on themselves openly, or that their behavior, their demo, their relationship with others, can tell that, okay, this person has you know, a low or poor self-talk when it comes to how they perceive themselves. So how do we even relate with ourselves? That is where we should be able to how do we relate with ourselves. So when I'm sad, do I have the understanding why I am sad? Do I know the things that are happening in my life, happening around me, or happening in the lives of people around me that, that trigger that emotion? So Mrs. is a lot of that comes to work always frowning and always you know, irritable easily. Have we tried to understand why? Some people will say, yeah, well, we have all come to work. Or everybody has come to work. So she, she has come to make money, I've come to make money. But beyond that, that is why we also need professionals, maybe a psychologist or an HR that is trained in this aspect, you know, to provide mental health first aid. Okay, if this person is always like this, there must be a reason. Maybe it's in the childhood experiences, maybe it's the marriage that is suffering. Maybe, you know, the person doesn't even like the work and the person is just there because she doesn't have any choice. She just has to make money. But there is no behavior, there is no, you know, act like we say, there's no action, or is it there's no reaction without an action? So there's no behavior without a trigger. Understanding or practicing emotional intelligence in the work is has to do with understanding why people act the way they do and how to manage those emotions. Even the very tough person is manageable. Even the very tough person. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Okay, that sounds interesting. So it's more like <clears throat> getting to understand why people are behaving the way they do. Like, um, let me give an instance. There is, let me say, there is like a workplace where someone is um is always getting on the nerves of others. You know, reacting in a, in a certain kind of way that make people get so annoyed. So um. What you're saying is in such a situation, I think it's best, let me say, when people have escalated this issue that person A is behaving in, sight, in a certain kind of way that is making the workplace uncomfortable for us, there should be a system, maybe the HR or anyone, a system that would um, try to call this person 
to kind of understand why they are doing this. But I've realized that there are certain workplaces where we are even afraid to call out people or to escalate how people are treating us. And because we feel uh, we may get fired for reporting such person or we just don't want to be in anybody's black book. You get, I see it. It has also happened in my, in one of my workplaces back in Nigeria. So what I want to know, what do you think someone can do in that situation? Like you're afraid, you just don't want to be in someone's black book. You just <laughs> want to play it safe. But then again, you don't want to suffer because of someone else's emotional, um, poorly managed emotions. What can you do? Okay. I hope you can hear me. Yeah, it's fine. The, the, this challenge will be resolved if we begin from the top. And I'm going to be honest about this. I mean, from the management, from the work culture and the system. So if someone is in a workplace where it's all about deliverables, meeting your KPI, you know, running and achieving the goals and tasks of the organization, then it will be challenging to achieve this. So uh, from the top now, we are addressing the management. There, is, there, there was a post that, uh, a short post that I did on LinkedIn a few months ago. And uh, I think Darwin, Darwin is the name of the instructor. And she talked about being a trauma-informed leader. Forgotten her last name now. A trauma-informed leader. And even though the post was a short one, I really recommend trauma-informed training for every leader, whether you, you, know, you are leading an organization, a leader in your family, like a parent, <clears throat> excuse me. So, you know, since we're talking about the workplace now, I really recommend that for every entrepreneur. More than 50% of, of people in the entire population of a place have experienced one form of trauma or the other. You know, I started by saying that the Mrs. Oilakin that is irritable and always frowning, it could be from my childhood experiences. It could be a marriage. So childhood experience, you know, of course, that's in the past. The marriage is the present, but it could be a traumatic marriage. It could be a case of infidelity, you know, and the finances and all sorts of things. And there are traumatic experiences. For this individual, you expect that person you know, to come to work looking you know, cheerful and smiling all the time. So it has to begin from the top. How many leaders are trauma informed? I mean, have an idea of what trauma is, what trauma does to us, the functioning of our brain, what it does to our esteem, what it does to you know, our intra personal relationship. That's the relationship we have with ourselves. What it does to our interpersonal relationship, the relationships that we have with others, how it also filters into other aspects of our lives. Every leader, I'm recommending that every leader that wants to, that wants to show that care, I mean that level of care, serious care, when it comes to the workplace, I'm recommending that every leader should be trauma informed, have an understanding, have an idea of what trauma is and how it affects us. Then, if, if you give people that platform that their mental health is not detached from their daily living, that you, you understand the, in, the relationship between their mental health and uh, you know, their job description or their roles, their functioning, then people would have, maybe not that person, but the people around you know, that person strong, suffering, struggling at that point, they would also have the the courage to speak out. And you would have provided the right channel for report. The channel would be a nature that is a mental health first aider. We also have training when it comes to mental health, being a mental health first aider that is someone that can identify um, challenges that someone is going through affecting their mental health, what this person can do. Yes, the person and not provide counseling you know, or therapy to support, but this person is already trained to identify certain trends. We just see it as, we see it as negative behavior. But this person has been trained to know that this behavior is a reflection of what is happening 
psychologically to this person, then this person cannot refer and refer to a psychologist, a psychiatrist, depending on the complexity of the challenge of that colleague or that employee. So we need to begin from the top. If the management of an organization or business owners, if they are not passionate, if they are not particular about um, the relationship between mental health and the workplace, then it will not fly because everyone will want to be quiet. Once you show vulnerability, it, it means that possibly in all meetings, you will be an example. And that is why people don't want to talk. The person cannot be an example in meetings or the person you know, can now be picked on from time to time. So once something happens, let's say he or she falls short of delivering a task of meeting in a deadline, then that person will always be fired at. Then um, they may be the line manager or the direct boss, whoever it is that the person reports to move, now refer to what has happened last week, what happened two months ago. And you know, because of the fear of losing your job, I mean, this is what brings you money. This is your, your livelihood, your source of income. People don't want to talk, so they will rather max their feelings, max their struggles, and just pretend that everything is going on fine. And whereas it's not. So it begins from the management of any organization. Wow. You know, I picked up something important you mentioned, um, tra being an, a trauma-informed leader. Being a tra trauma-informed leader, it makes a whole lot of difference. Okay. And then you mentioned about um, a workplace, understanding the relationship between mental health and work. Uh, can you just tell me, like, what's the relationship between mental health and the job we do? So our processes as humans begin from the brain. I tell people that you're hungry. I mean, that is like the simplest and gay example that I can use. If you're hungry and you begin to feel you know, the hunger pants, the feeling that you want to eat, it is not just a natural occurrence. Something has happened in your brain that has transmitted information to your body that it's time to eat. And this is the relationship between our mental health and workplace. If one is struggling with his or our mental health, or if the mental state of an individual is poor, is struggling, is lagging, is suffering, you know, whichever adjective that we want to use, then that person will not function properly in the workplace. Because of course, to carry out the job, your brain also needs to be in the right you know, frame of mind. Your brain needs to be settled. Your brain needs to be relaxed. Your brain needs to be positive. And you know, when I'm saying the brain, I mean also the combination of the mind, because the brain affects the entire functioning. So you know, a man that is having challenges at home, dealing with the wife, or it has to do with finance, or maybe he has you know, a child that is a special needs child, for example, and it's taking a lot of time. That man's you know, mental health is already struggling because there is no how a parent would detach that aspect of life from his or her functioning. Or let's say you know, a woman that is trying to conceive. Yes, the money could be there, the job could be there, the love from the husband could be there. But every woman, every woman wants to carry a child. Every woman wants to be a child. So you can't say that that aspect of the woman's life is separated from the workplace. No, it's not. Because once she begins to think about it and then maybe have certain you know, discussions, cognitive discussions, like we do at times, maybe begin to blame herself, blame you know, past experiences that have happened, or God so good in this part of the world where we don't know how to mind our business sometimes. People begin to ask certain questions, yes. So a large extent, we don't know how to mind our business. People begin to ask certain questions. Ah, Auntie Vero, are you not ready to burn? Ah, it's been three years old. This is this and that. All this, 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 you know, they begin to make comments, comments that maybe to them it just seems like they care. But these comments are haunting the, the, the person, the woman, the individual. So there is no how that challenge will not affect 
the world because she could be at work and then she's thinking about what her neighbor said yesterday. Or maybe, you know, what her family member said yesterday. If there's pressure from there, or what her in laws you know, said last week, if there's pressure from there, or what people in the environment are even saying. And some people even go as far as shaming. They can say, oh, don't send my child on an errand. Oh, you don't even know what it means to have a child, you know. Statements like that can come from people from this part of the world. So there is no how our mental health is not tied to our workplace. If we are not in the right frame of mind, if our brain is suffering and struggling as a result of other struggles that we are having in our lives, and we are, we are not able to manage them, or we have been unable to cope with those circumstances and manage them so much that it does not filter into other aspects of our lives, then our work will suffer at some point in time, because we'll be at work, we'll be absent-minded, we'll be at work and possibly angry or transfer aggression on others. Yes. Hmm. Wow. Thank you so much for those examples, because they're actually the realities of some people, you know. Let me let me bring it down to um, to us. Like, let me say, like Africa, like Nigeria. You know, these... Uh, mental health awareness is still is still growing compared to the western part of the world and not every organization is really interested in the mental well-being of people of their employees you know that's why you explained okay this is how, this is how the mental health can impact people's jobs so if they understand this they'll be invested in people's mental well-being for optimum product, uh, productivity and also income, increased income of the workplace. So the question now is, because of this lack of awareness, because of this lack of awareness, what advice will you give to, um, let me see, just an employee, okay? An employee that is suffering the toxicity from other people, from other work colleagues because somebody will just will not just wake up one morning and quit their jobs because of something going on in the workplace because the, the bills have to be paid they need to feed as well as probably school fees and stuff like that so what will you tell the individual that is in the midst of all of this so how will, it, will they manage their emotions to thrive in the meantime probably until they get another job or anything like that. You need to take care of yourself. I mean, the individual now, as an employee that is struggling with his mental health, you need to take care of yourself. While I understand that financial challenges can also affect our mental health, but if you know that you're struggling with some aspect of life that is affecting your work, or it would even be the work that is affecting your mental health, then my, my advice would be, first of all, have a plan. Have a plan. Uh, you can't just wake up and say, I, I want to quit my job. That's not realistic. You could have a plan of, let's say, three months, four months, and then how am I going to save in the next you know, one month to the fourth month? So if I quit my, if I quit this job, for example, how long to be realistic? You want to look at um, your niche, your market, the kind of services that you provide or what you sell. How long will it take me to get another job? Will it take me like a month? Will it take me like two? And then how long will it be if I do not get another job? How long will it be for me to start getting agitated? Because you know yourself, some persons cannot stay one week without working. Another question, this person can ask is, well, what can I do in the meantime before I get a job or the job of my dreams or another job that is befitting to the one that I'm quitting or another job, you know, that will, uh, you know, suffice for the one that I want to quit. These are some of the questions that you need to ask. Now, because if it is the job that is affecting the mental health of that individual, a time will come where you will lose a lot. And I will say for everyone listening to me, underline that phrase, lose a lot. 
such as your self-esteem, such as the ability to control your emotions, that's true, such as the ability to manage yourself, and it might even tend towards losing your life. I mean, when you are not in the right frame of mind, when you are not in that place, you know, to function as you would love to, or to function to your full capacity, how do you become beneficial to yourself and to others? And we are not finding fulfillment. That is where in thoughts such as suicide, self-harm will begin to come. That's where people begin to have suicidal ideations. Hmm. So the best thing is first to look out for yourself. You may think that, oh, if I quit the job, will I get another, another one? That is the first fear. And that is why the individual needs to ask the questions that I have rolled out earlier. Have a plan. What do you think will work for you? Three months, six months. It should not also be, it should not also take too long because our mental health, I tell people, our mental health can deteriorate. Just the way our physical health can deteriorate. If you're having malaria symptoms, malaria in, is common in this part of the world, Nigeria. If you're having malaria symptoms and you know that this is malaria symptoms, and you, you don't treat yourself, you don't go to the hospital, you don't get anti-malaria drug, you don't get tested. What will happen one day is you might begin to hold your head like this because of the intense headache, that feeling, and then fever. For some persons, it even gets acute and they lose their lives. Malaria is just the simplest I can use. Then you know, there are other sicknesses that if you do not pay attention to it and say, I'll visit the hospital, you see high blood pressure, I'll visit the hospital. Our body, you know, our physical health deteriorate and our mental health can also deteriorate. So if you're, if you're saying that, okay, because of the fear that you miss out, you may not get another job in time, also understand that your mental health, that is the functioning of your brain and your mind can also deteriorate. You can get to a point where you may even get the job of your dreams and you can't function in that job. Like you have the job where, oh, they care about an employee's wellness so much and then uh, the work time is favorable, the pay is favorable for your struggling. You're struggling to show up daily. There are now mental conditions such as depression, such as hopelessness. You're not you're struggling struggling to make it to work and even though they are showing the they are showing the care and that support but you are just struggling you have hit rock bottom so before we get to that point where we hit rock bottom do something wow wow this awareness is on another level because you know not everyone has figured out the fact that if you remain in a toxic space you you lose as in you lose you lose yourself you lose your esteem you lose a lot of things and before you know it these negative thoughts starts coming so um just like you've mentioned it's very important for us to have plan like an exit plan it's not something you'll be like okay let me just be managing no because like you mentioned just like the physical health deteriorates that's also how the mental health deteriorates but if you have a plan you it also helps you because there is something you're looking forward to so it can help you cope in the meantime until you exit but don't just manage that toxicity because you will lose so thank you so much for that. That was really, really insightful. Thank you so much for that. Do you have any last words for people listening on emotional intelligence in the workplace? It would be that we should be empathic with ourselves. I preach empathy, I preach self-awareness, I preach um, mental wellness. When we are empathic with ourselves, we would have the ability not just to recognize that others are struggling, but we can also offer support and help. And this is not just for all that. Being empathic and being compassionate with yourself would save you. So you know, when I'm saying you, I mean everyone listening to me to save you a lot of decisions that are you know hazardous to your health, particularly to your mental health. Because when you're empathic and compassionate towards yourselves, you will always think about the implication of your decisions. The decision of others that you are involved in, either directly or directly, and how the relationship of others affects you. So I'm telling everyone today that 
care hearted. Learn how to be compassionate with yourself. Yes. And it's a skill that we all can learn that is self-compassion. Learn how to be compassionate with yourself. The way you talk to yourself, the way you treat yourself, the way you address issues, the way you make decisions. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. I'm very, very sure that somebody will find that really helpful. So rather than beating up yourself, uh, blaming yourself, just show yourself some compassion so that you will also be useful to the rest of us as well. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you. So you're a mental health counselor. If someone needs your services, how can they get to you? Okay. I'm on LinkedIn as Bossedi Christina Elaki. Uh, across all my social media handles, um, actually, that LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, my um, social media handle names is Osede Christina Relaki. And you can also reach me on email, write Osede Relaki at gmail.com. Write, that is the, uh, the word to write, to pen down something. W R I T E. Write Bosede Welaki at gmail.com. So send me a mail, send me a DM, connect with me on all my social media handles, and you know, feel free to enter my DM. I would be willing and most glad to answer all questions and queries. I'll would, I would also put this in the description of um, this podcast so feel free to reach out to her she has given you the access feel free to write her and maximize her services she's really good you listen so i don't even need to say more <laughs> <laughs> all right thank you so much thank you everyone who has joined this podcast and i know you found it really helpful as much as you can please share this share this to your work colleagues if you can in fact, I, I encourage you, share this to your line managers, to your employer, your bosses, share it to them so that they will also learn about uh, being trauma-informed leaders and also make the workspace a safe place for you because you spend most of your time there and it can impact on your entire well-being, how you relate to your family or whoever is important to you when you go back home. So inform your uh your work colleagues your leaders about this web about this podcast so that they too will learn okay thank you so much for joining bye, -bye. thank you for having me